I put out a newsletter last week, my, my PR Bytes newsletter, which I uh, do uh, four days a week. And it was all about two social movements, which were emerging over a series of hours on Twitter. And you could see them trending in a way that things were starting to come back. And I was fascinated by what was going on behind the communities. What was driving it? What were the things that you could pull out of it that perhaps you could replicate too? Because this is one of the things I do in, in the newsletter. I, I look at common situations that are happening there and then, and I say, well, how could we embrace those techniques? What could we use in it? And to give you a bit of background, because it was a really popular article, and I just thought, let's do an episode on this as well. To give you a bit of background, there were two particular situations going on. There was one involving a computer game called Team Fortress 2, and the other one was the resurgence of the GameStop saga. And I'll explain what these are in a second and what, why I think they're really important. But both of these were showcasing how small-scale social activism can shape industries and influence decisions in companies. And I'm not talking about politics here. I'm talking about you know, computer games. I'm talking about a bit of investing. So if we, if we start off with Team Fortress 2, right? this game has been pretty popular with players for several years. But they've become really frustrated with bots. Now, bots are coded by other people, and they're programmed to act like real players. So when you join the game, um, and it's a shooting game, so when you join in the game, players will instantly get shot in the head by one of these bots and ruin the game. Or these bots will prevent them from getting even onto the game. Or in some cases, people were saying that these bots are using the internal messaging to share hate speech. Basically, players aren't happy. And then over a series of about five to seven hours, I was looking at this trend. Um, the hashtags save TFT2, uh, TF2 and fix TF2 started trending across the whole of the United States on Twitter. And the campaign this time seems to have been kicked off with a website. It's a single page, very simple website, but nicely designed with some good images. And what I really liked about it was a very simple narrative about what the problem was, what past efforts they've done to try and fix this, and fix this as a community, and demands for what they want to change. This wasn't from the, the, the developers or from the game company, this is from the community themselves. The clarity of the campaign is what really stood out compared to many campaigns you see, because even as a very casual gamer myself, I get what they want and why they want it. I don't play these sorts of games, but I understand what it was. So let's turn now to the other situation. This is GameStop, and we can start looking at the parallels. Now, you might remember a few years ago that the stock market got in a real twist when Reddit users banded together to boost a company called GameStop. Now, GameStop was a struggling retailer, and hedge funds who bet on, or in this particular case, are betting on the fact that a company's going to go down in value were getting ready to see it collapse. And this created a real David and Goliath narrative story at the time that really captured the imagination of many Reddit users. And lots of small investors and individuals put money into GameStop, boosting its value and hurting the hedge funds, but also getting a sense that they were earning money as well. Now, the great power of the narrative here was that people could see in real time with this GameStop situation the effect they were having. You know, you, you've got live streamers who were putting out news like, almost in the style of like CNN, of what was happening in real time. You could look at your phone and you were engaged every few minutes to see whether the stock price was going up or down or what developments were happening. And this David and Goliath narrative really helped to drive it further. And people were, at least apparently, making money in real time. And who doesn't want that? So you've got a real-time situation there. The, when you look at the real-time nature of, of the, um, the game, they're going to struggle a bit with this one. And I'll round up these points in a moment, by the way. But, you know, the, the Team Fortress 2 users are clearly hoping that by joining together, they're going to win too. It's that David versus Goliath narrative again. Indeed, they're, they're actually emboldened by a recent campaign by gamers over a game called Helldivers 2, where people power forced a change in the game. Sony was requiring people to sign up to their international registration system. Gamers objected and Sony backed down. But the problem for the Team Fortress players compared to the GameStop is that the narrative for them is kind of weak. You know, where does it go if no one replies to their calls? There's no real-time feedback. There's no story happening that you can engage with, no progress. It's only going to last as long as other players complain en masse. So what can you do to kind of embrace what's going on here? I mean, if, for starters, if you imagine yourself as being the boss of, of Team Fortress 2, what do you do? The game came out, I think it was five years ago or something like that. It was a few years ago. Are you actually going to make more revenue out of the game? And these are the hard decisions you've got to make. Are you going to make more revenue out of the game if you spend a lot of time trying to fix the issues on a game people have already bought? But equally, if you ignore it and build a new game, which is better and has more anti-cheat systems, will people buy it anyway? In the game space, people are always looking for a new game to come out. Maybe you're going to upset those hardcore fans that really like that particular game, but will people move on to this new game? Probably will. 
equally, will the narrative grow? Are people who are upset about this particular game start damaging the reputation of other games or your brand that you're putting out? You know, there's a general narrative, even amongst players, that games improve. And so you know a new game will always be coming out and more reliable and will have new quirks and new interesting things to it. And a new game, obviously, is one that you can sell and generate revenue from. So you've got to balance up. Well, how much impact is this actually going to have from a brutal business point of view? Now, if we move to GameStop, well, maybe it plays into their hands, the fact that the value is going up. You know, they want to be valued more. So maybe they will welcome this as a business from, from a business decision point of view. Now, if you're a hedge fund, then I suspect you're not going to want to see this. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot more stories coming out um, over the coming weeks if this trend keeps continuing. Uh, talking about the people, the in individual investors who didn't make money. Now, if this is more than just a blip, I'm sure we're going to see lots more stories of this undermining that feeling that you can make a difference as an individual investor because it's not going to obviously work with what is wanted by that business. So let's try and sort of sum some of these up because I've given you a bit of an overview of the scenarios, but let's try and sum some of it up from the point of view of PR. If we break it down, you know, both stories are generated by real users, not a company. It's coming up from the community. But the question then is you can say to yourself, okay, well, if we're trying to drive a campaign, who could be our champion? Number two, what is the environment? Have people recently succeeded in this space and they're emboldened with a sense that we can win this time? If the narrative is driving towards change or driving towards the possibility of success, then it helps to get people excited because they think they might rather than just going, ah, this will never do anything. Number three, what is the David versus Goliath angle that you can take? You know, we know, well, David and Goliath, it's a narrative from thousands of years ago. It, it's, it works. People still want to support the underdog and be part of the underdog and win against the bigger. Number four, how can you make it real time? How can you give real time feedback to a narrative so that they stay engaged with it on a daily basis or even minute by minute? And number five, how can this campaign impact people's lives in a way they will see? Now, for GameStop, it was about making money. If you know, um, for the uh, for the game for Team Fortress Two, it's about whether you can play that game that you enjoy playing again. So let's try and look at it from an example point of view because I think this helps in this particular case. Let's say you're running a campaign for a homeless charity, and you're asking people to donate to it. So let's say first of all you have a real time tally of the money coming in, which is being updated on social media every hour or whatever, giving that live feedback loop. You know, maybe a live stream even on Twitch or updates on TikTok, um, but ideally a platform which is more geared up for a real-time timeline so people can actually follow on. And it's not sort of algorithmically hidden like things seem to be on Facebook. Then you show people, not their faces, as they walk into the homeless center and you literally count how much it's costing versus how much people are donating in real time and the shortfall. Or if you make more money than you hope for, how many more people you can help tonight. You're showing a literal narrative in real time of something that's happening. So you can then use that to power this campaign to make something in real time with real time feedback, which has got a call to action. And it's got real people, real people in hardship who are struggling to get through the night. You're bringing together all those narratives to drive something which is incredibly worthwhile. So if we kind of sum this up, social movements are powerful. But there's definitely techniques in there which are about a strong narrative and about a people-led approach that can be helping us to communicate, particularly with campaigns or with social narratives or anything like that. They're powerful techniques that can help to get people on board, make them feel part of it, and achieve things together. Now, this can apply to products as well. You know, Maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, not in my industry. This is not going to be working for me. But what is it that you're actually doing with your product? It's changing things. It's helping people. It's speeding things up. It's probably making people's lives better with a product. It's helping something like that. So there's always going to be some kind of person on the street narrative that is coming out of what you're doing. So how can you embrace that with the David and Goliath? The, the feeling we can achieve something. The feeling of real time. How can you embrace all that? How can you do that and apply those techniques today? If you use one of these, I would be fascinated to know. I would love to know, particularly if you've done any real-time campaigns as well. Let me know. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, you can contact me straight away just by clicking on me and connecting with me there. 
And uh, I would love to get you on the show to talk about it too. But I hope you found this interesting. As I say, one of the articles from the PR Bytes newsletter, and if you'd like to sign up for that, uh, you can get that simply by going to the Public Relations Podcast newsletter. Just click on the link, the newsletter link. Uh, publicrelationspodcast.com is the website. Click on the newsletter link, and you can sign up to that for the daily newsletter. That's it for now. Have a good rest of your week. <laughs>